Welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring future and future creators, and for all those that like really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your uh, life sciences ambassador along for the journey today. Uh, so today we have a really exciting topic. Um, so form. Uh, is generally defined as the shape and structure of something uh, as distinguished from the materials that it's constructed from. And specifically, the branch of biology that deals with form uh, in living organisms and the relationships between the various structures is known as morphology. Uh, every level of the, the human body, animal body for that matter, requires very complex form control mechanisms to be functional throughout our lifetime uh, across the many hierarchies, DNA, cell, tissue, organ, limb, and body segment, uh, in order to accomplish a range of biologic outputs, everything from uh, embryogenesis to growth, repair, regeneration, preventing tumor formation, uh, even in the uh, neuroplasticity of the human brain. Yet when it comes to topics like shape, size, polarity, position, where both the properties and characteristics of the system and the sort of reciprocal interplay between the components uh, are extremely important, we need to go a little bit beyond just studying the you know, particular gene or the protein or that stem cell to a range of very fascinating top-down control processes uh, in the sort of biological, morphological architecture of life. Um, Today, we are, have the honor uh, of being joined by a true thought leader in this space, Dr. Michael Levin, uh, who is Tufts University professor who holds the Vannevar Bush Endowed Chair in Biology, uh, who also serves as both director of the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology, and also is director of the Allen Discovery Center. Uh, Dr. Levin's group's focus is on understanding biophysical mechanisms that implement decision-making during complex pattern regulation, and harnessing endogenous bioelectric dynamics towards rational control of form and growth. Uh, his lab's current directions involve understanding how somatic cells form bioelectric networks uh, and store and recall pattern memories that guide morphogenesis. Uh, he's involved in creating next generation artificial intelligence tools, helping scientists understand top down control mechanisms in pattern regulation, sort of a new bioinformatics of shape. Uh, and ultimately using these insights to help develop new capabilities in both regenerative medicine and engineering. Uh, Dr. Levin uh, got dual degrees uh, in his bachelor's in both computer science and biology at Tufts and then received his PhD from Harvard. Uh, he did his postdoc training at Harvard Medical School where he began to uncover this new bioelectrical language that cells use to coordinate their activity during embryogenesis. Uh, his independent labs at both Harvard and Tufts are actively involved in developing new molecular genetic and conceptual tools to probe large-scale information processing during regeneration, embryogenesis, and cancer suppression. Uh, he has a variety of publications, uh, endless range of publications, and many honors, including the Scientist Division Award and Distinguished Scholar Award. Uh, all that being said, welcome Dr. Michael Levin to the show today. Thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a re it's a real honor. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing the show for a while, and I'm really Me glad too. to have you. Um, Mike, typically, you know, we, we start off the show uh, just by, you know, giving our guests the floor for a little bit so you can uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, sort of, you know, where you grew up, how you got interested in uh, both sort of the electrical engineering side of things and biology, and, and a little bit of your journey into what, you know, what I'll sort of broadly call sort of the frontiers of, of, uh, of biological science. Sure. Um, well, when I was fairly young, uh, we're talking uh, uh, basically around uh, six, seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, two, two things uh, I remember that uh, distinctly kind of set me on this path. One was a, uh, a, a love of engineering and it, and it all started with uh, my dad taking the back off of our television set. We had this large uh, kind of ancient TV set uh, and he would take the back off and, and you could sort of see all the, all the components inside. And I remember being incredibly impressed that there was somebody who knew how to put those things together in exactly the right way. And it was pretty clear that you couldn't just randomly jumble them together. So somebody knew how to do that in order to 
make the cartoons come out the other end. Mm -hmm. So this idea that uh, we have this 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 rational engineering where we can we can take parts that by themselves don't do much of anything and put them together in a particular pattern, a, uh, a an organization that ends up being the more than uh, the sum of its parts. Okay, so that was that was a kind of something profound, and I remember thinking that whoever it was that knew how to do that, that's what I would like to do. I'd, I'd like to be the guy that knows how to do it. Um, in parallel, I had a friend who was uh, very much into bugs and insects. And so we would go outside and, and he, he, was, he was an older kid and he knew everything there was to know about insects. And he would show me all these caterpillars and, uh, and, and beetles and things. And I, I, was, I, I was really amazed that, that these things were, uh, had very complex uh, behaviors and, and morphology, of course. They, they, they look like very specific um, shapes. And, uh, and I was thinking, and I, I always remember thinking that, well, they also must be made of parts. They also came together in some fashion or other. And wouldn't it be amazing if we understood how that worked and what could we do if we really understood how parts come together? And in particular, I was always interested in these living things as a as primarily a cognitive system, meaning that you know it was clear that they had goals they were trying to reach, and they they liked certain things and they didn't like other things. And if you if you put things in their way, they'd figure out a way around it. Mm -hmm. And and it was always I, I was always really interested in trying to understand how it is that pieces of of matter, right, phys physical stuff like things you might have in your kitchen, sure. uh, come together to form a creature that has preferences. It might have memories, it might have uh, a mind, it might have an internal perspective, um, and and for sure it has complex behaviors and uh, and, and goal directed activity. So I was always interested at the intersection of those two kinds of areas. And then uh, be, be, being older and then emigrating, I was I was born in in uh, Moscow, Russia. We left uh, in 1978 when I was nine. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember coming here. And uh, after uh, my dad got a job at a computer company, he was able to, to, uh, to, to introduce me to some computer hardware. I mean, this was, you know, a fairly ancient stuff at this point. But um, I remember thinking that, well, this is very interesting, because here's something that follows rules exactly. And so there, if we understood what the rules ought to be, we might have a, a shot at putting together some of the stuff from scratch, right? Could we build some of these things from the ground up if, if we understood how, how they worked? And so right around this, uh, this intersection of, of, of biology and um, uh, engineering and computer science is, is where my interests lay. And um, I, I did a lot of coding growing up. Um, had a had a software company briefly, uh, but really I was interested in um, working in artificial intelligence in the broad sense. Mm -hmm. So so not specifically in any one technology, but this idea that could we create minds that from scratch, where mind could be anything from a very simple thing that uh, that that exhibits memory and, and and behavior to something very complex, which you know something like general AI. So these were this was uh, my interest growing up. And you know. Thinking along those lines and, and, and sort of um, and, and dealing with the, um, I won't say dumb parts, so I don't want to call cells dumb, but in the context of sort of this theme uh, of the so-called morphogenetic field, sort of a, a concept that is, is quite old. I mean, it goes back a, a little over a century now where, you know, we have this process, this mysterious process where we take dumb cells that, um, in some fact, you know, they know what their neighbor is doing, but when it comes to sort of developing a complex structure, whether it's an organ or a limb, not just in the right size and shape, but also position, you know, that, uh, hey, this is my left hand, a right hand does not go here, and, and my heart is here and not inside my skull, and so forth. Um, these are really, you know, these concepts go back a while, but even well before sort of we really understood a lot about DNA. <laughs> um, uh, there's versions of this concept that uh, have popped up in the literature in terms of embryonic fields and, and embryogenesis, uh, the, the symplasmic fields and, and plant development, but sort of they all come down to, as you were saying, sort of this top-down concept that, yes, we can look at these genes and these proteins, but at the end of the day, there's a little more going on <laughs> controlling the shots. Can you talk a little bit about this field concept? Because in many ways, I look at you as sort of reawakening sort of something that yeah, people talked about 100 years ago, but sort of forgot. And now you're bringing it back with a lot of the new tools that you have in the 21st century. If you could go a little further with that, I think it'd be great. Sure. Um, so let's talk about this. Uh, the 
reason that the field concept was uh, so attractive for these mm -hmm. questions is uh, not simply the kind of uh, physical definition of, of what a field is from physics, but actually the, the, the real point is that in biology, we often see decisions that are being made about fairly large scale structures, mm -hmm. things that individual cells uh, don't have access to. And uh, I'll, give, I'll give some examples momentarily, but the idea is that if, if individual cells, and actually all across scale, so molecules into, into molecular networks, into cells, tissues, and so on, at each level, you find that um, in biology, these levels are able to integrate into a, a coherent functional system that exists at the next higher level. And so th this means that, you're, that the system is making non-local decisions, and mm -hmm. this requires some sort of integration both across space and time, which is why field concepts immediately come to come to mind. Um, so spatial, because you're, you're finding that, that cells now have to uh, make decisions about very large things, as you say, about the shape of an eye or the identity of an organ or the, the length of a hand or things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and so there must be some way of integrating information across space, but also time in the sense that the larger collective may have a kind of memory of what happened before. It may uh, even have some uh, anticipatory activity in terms of, well, if the same thing happened X number of times before, then eventually it may learn to anticipate it. So these these kinds of things are what is really, uh, was driving uh, people who think about fields in this scenario is that how do uh, uh, local agents, whatever their scale, integrate together to become a bigger agent. And when I say agent, I simply mean that the bigger system is not just an emergent collection of whatever the smaller subsystems are doing, mm -hmm. but it has its own integrated goals. So, so some people are, are comfortable with this. Uh, for example, in when, when you study ants and termites, people often talk about the colony. It measures things, remembers things, and tries to achieve things that the individual ants do not. Mm -hmm. So there's this, in an important sense, there's a, there's a new level um, forming. And of course, in cybernetics and control theory, we're very comfortable with the fact that you could take parts that by themselves don't, uh, don't try to do anything, but if you arrange it into a thermostat uh, kind of loop, then you've got a system that tries to keep to a certain temperature range, for example, right? So it takes a measurement of the temperature, it compares to a set point, and then it heats or cools depending on whether you're, which, whether you're out of that system or not. So there's a there's a there's a range of uh, of other uh, other phenomena where these kind of um, goal directed systems that uh, arise from a com from a particular combination of subunits are, um, are are studied and this is what drives this 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 idea of trying to understand fields basically it's collectives right it's it's what does a collective of smaller agents what does it remember what does it want what does it try to do that's distinct from what what the individual agents do and I think you know I, I would give you just a couple of examples Examples from sure. biology that can that can get us get us thinking about this. So so here's here's uh, something that and there there are many examples like this, but here's just one that we discovered a couple of years ago. So um, tadpoles, of, of frog tadpoles, mm -hmm. have a very particular uh, of arrangement of the face. So there's a there's a couple of eyes, there's a jaw, there's some gills, there's all, some nostrils, all kinds of all mm -hmm. kinds of organs. Mm -hmm. And in order for a tadpole to become a frog it has to rearrange its face because frog faces don't look like tadpole faces. So you have to move the nostrils, you have to move the jaw, you have to move the eyes, a bunch of things have to move. So in the past, it was thought that what the frog's, uh, ge what the frog's genome encodes is a set of hardwired movements. Never, never mind how a genome is supposed to encode movements, we'll, we'll get to that. But, but, it, but, it, but it was thought that, that this uh, process was hardwired in the sense that all tadpoles look the same, all frogs look the same. So if you move everything in a very particular way, you will get from here to there and then life is good. So what we found is that uh, uh, if you in fact take a tadpole and you produce it in a way that we call them Picasso tadpoles because everything's in the wrong place. The mm -hmm. eyes are up here, the jaws are off to the side, the nostrils are up here, you know, every, everything is just mixed around. Right. The amazing thing is that largely they become perfectly normal frogs. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because all the pieces move around through fairly unnatural paths that they would no never normally do. And they end up in a correct frog-like face pattern and then they stop. Then the system stops, uh, stops metamorphosing. So what you have then is the fact that the genetics doesn't in some way specify a set of movements. What the genetics specifies is a machine that can do an amazing thing. It can ascertain its current configuration. 
it has some representation of what the correct configuration is. And then it can progressively reduce the error. So what you have is, a, we, we call this pattern homeostasis or anatomical homeostasis. And it's very much like that uh, thermostat loop to which I alluded, you have the ability to progressively reduce the error toward some particular encoded goal state. You have a set point towards which you, you progressively reduce the error. And it turns out that this ability to be plastic, to issue commands to the individual cells, which, which is what you have to do in order to get the, or, the organs to move, mm -hmm. um, in order to reduce the error uh, of a very large thing. So a frog face is a massive thing for, from the scale of a single cell. Sure. Um, no individual cell is, is, knows what the face looks like. This is not a property of any of the individual cells. This is a property of the collective. And so what you have here is a situation where uh, the collective has a particular set point. It's an anatomical set point and uh, it, it works to reduce the error to achieve it. So this is the sort of thing we need to be able to explain, right? And, and think about how far any kind of um, genetic uh, uh, explanation is from something like this, because it's not enough to think about how individual cells uh, execute specific rules according to uh, what their what their genome says, and then uh, there's this emergent phenomenon. That's how a lot of people think about development this way, right? It's it's emergent. Every every cell does something, and out comes you know something something amazing. Uh, but this is this is much more complex than that. This is actually a uh, a, a system that um, is able to ascertain uh, its 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 configuration after really pretty drastic deformations, you know, um, and then still get to where it's going, despite the fact that it's starting from the wrong place and you may intervene with it in the middle, but it still gets to where it's going. And this is the grand challenge of biology. It's not just to understand the mechanisms. It's not just about understanding the hardware, which, which is, is genomically encoded, the, the hardware that every cell has, all the proteins. We really need to understand the software. We really need to understand how collectives uh, follow large scale goals. And I think, I think this is, you know, maybe the most exciting question in biology and it bleeds into everything from swarm robotics to philosophy of mind to regenerative medicine. Like this is the, I think this is the central question. And, and a major aspect of your research over the years has of course been, um, the area of, of developmental bioelectricity, uh, and the, you know, the concept that, um, and I'm, well, I, I'm sorry if I butcher this, but I'll, I'll ask you to sort of take us on a, on a, on a, on a path through this as well. Um, cells and tissues throughout the human body use all sorts of different ion channels to, to communicate with one another, uh, process of, of electrotaxis and so forth. Um, these are endogenous electrical currents and fields. Uh, there's different fluxes, uh, different resting potentials. Uh, obviously, uh, people may, may be most familiar with the 18th century work of Luigi Galvani and his dancing frog legs and so forth from that perspective. But take us a little bit, if you would, on sort of the, uh, the 20th century um, domain of bioelectricity and sort of how you've now taken sort of what's been done there and, and taken it to a whole other level. I think this is a, a very important connection. Sure. Um, a couple of different ways to think about it. I mean, one, one thing you might do is uh, ask the question of, uh, where did nerves come from? So, so we're most familiar with electricity in the nervous system. So muscle mm -hmm. and nerve, of course, use electricity to, 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 to do their thing. And, and if you sort of, a, a, lot, of, a lot of people um, make a very sharp distinction between neuroscience and non-neural uh, you know, non-neural biology. And mm -hmm. um, actually there is no sharp, uh, there is no sharp dividing line. And in fact, we, we and, and others have been using uh, uh, concepts and tools of neuroscience to study all sorts of things about development. Mm -hmm. And this is for a simple reason that nerves did not just suddenly spring into being. So, so right. nerves evolved from other cell types and those cell types were using electricity long before brains showed up. Electricity is an ancient, ancient uh, way of uh, processing information. It was discovered uh, at the very least around the time of bacterial biofilms, maybe before that. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, evolution discovered really early on in, in, the, in, the, in the process that bioelectricity or electricity is a really convenient way to do computation. It is not an accident that our brains are, are built on this principle. It is not an accident that our current computer technology is built on this. Electrical circuits are really convenient for information, for distributed, uh, integrated uh, problem solving, for 
uh, for memory, for decision making, uh, electricity is really excellent at this. So um, it was recognized for many years, actually, and there, there, there have been some great people right from uh, around the 1900s to, uh, to now that have studied electricity and bioelectricity in embryonic development. They've studied how cells communicate with each other during regeneration, during cancer suppression, yeah. uh, and so on. And you know, one, one sort of traditional way uh, to look at it would be that, well, bioelectricity is one more set of mechanisms like biomechanics, like physical forces, chemical gradients. It's one more uh, a physical mechanism that is required for pattern formation, for, for, for complex anatomies. And, and, that, and that's all true, but I think there's a much deeper truth here. And the deeper truth is that um, what it's actually used for, it's not just another mechanism. It's actually a computational medium. Mm -hmm. This is what, this, these bioelectric networks are actually what mediates cognitive-like processes in living tissues. So all of the things that brains do in terms of driving behavior, moving the body around through space, um, non-neural electric networks in the rest of the body do the same thing. They do it more slowly. Mm -hmm. And their output is not moving, uh, controlling muscles to move through space. Their output, which is a much more ancient system, this is this is how it was at the at the beginning. Their system is designed to uh, control all the different cells and make sure that you get the correct uh, um, the correct configuration in anatomical morphous space. Mm -hmm. So instead of guiding you through three dimensional space, they're guiding a, an embryo or a developing limb or anything like that. Um, they're guiding it through uh, a complex anatomical morphous space by moving, by telling the cells to differentiate, to migrate, to proliferate, and so on. So, so, so the reason we're so excited about bioelectricity uh, is, uh, is, is not just that it's cool and, and it's a really interesting uh, area of, of biophysics, but because by controlling, by reading and then controlling these bioelectric um, gradients, we get a glimpse of the computations that are happening inside the tissue. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to how nowadays there's this project for, of neural decoding, right? So neuro neuroscientists right. would like to read the electrical activity of the brain. And if, and if we knew what we were doing, we could, we could sort of deconvolve that into uh, some sort of representation of what the, what the creature was thinking about. So is it a, you know, maybe a visual image or maybe there's a plan or a goal or a, uh, uh, you know, something's going on in that, in that brain and we're going to read it out. We're going to read out the cognitive content of the mind by looking at the electrical activity of the brain and maybe maybe even predict what it what that what that creature is going to do before they do it right because mm -hmm. because we get to we get to read the information structures that guide behavior we are doing the exact same thing for the rest of the body mm -hmm. so the idea is that by tracking and learning to decode we call this uh, cracking the the bioelectric code mm -hmm. and by learning to decode this this information we are getting a glimpse of what information is being processed by the cells of tissues and better yet, we can re we can now rewrite that information. So um, just like uh, people like uh, like Tonegawa at MIT who are using uh, optogenetics and those kind of tools to incept false memories into brains, mm -hmm. we can in we can now insert uh, uh, artificial um, uh, bioelectric uh, anatomical memories into tissue and get them to build something else. And, and, and we, th we think this is really exciting for regenerative medicine because it offers a whole new set of opportunities than the kind of traditional um, bioengineering and, and genomic editing approaches. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's, um, let's talk about a couple of these areas in terms of um, what I'll call mo modulating um, anatomical morphospace. space. You know, I, I know that you, um, you work with, uh, Pharmaceutical com or compounds, bioactive substances that modulate um, uh, ion channels and so forth to have different effects. But then there, uh, there's also sort of my previous employer from several years ago, GlaxoSmithKline, investing in sort of the, this term electroceuticals nowadays, where you're getting um, uh, the drug out of the way entirely and just, you know, the zap, what <laughs> I'll genetically call it. So yep. Let's talk a little bit about um, there's two areas of, of morphous space modulation that I think are fascinating. I mean, everything that you do is fascinating, but I thought we'd touch on these two. And one is this general theme of uh, normalizing uh, cancer. Uh, yeah. And so this uh, fascinating ability, we've seen this in the literature for a while. It hasn't really been known about why it happens. Uh, you know, when you take a regenerating limb and you stuff it full of 
tumor cells and a regular limb regenerates or the work that was actually done here in Philadelphia back in the 1970s by um, Beatrice Mintz's group yep. uh, in, in teratocarcinoma <clears throat> and embryos. Talk a little bit about this um, using uh, the ability to modulate morphous space to normalize cancer, if you would. I think it's a fascinating thought. Sure. Um, yeah. L let me let me start out uh, with the with the electroceutical idea. So, um, at at the risk of uh, uh, making uh, making people upset, I, I will no, make claim upset, that <laughs> uh, I I will say that I think using electrodes to impact bioelectric state is um, is not the future of this field. I think okay. I think that's actually a step backwards. And the reason is because what we are trying to do here is to modulate the information flow that is happening inside the system and get it to do something else. R physically, uh, trying to alter resting potential patterns, sta stable developmental resting potential patterns with electrodes is incredibly hard. Okay. It's, it's good for spiking. So if your target is the nervous system and a lot of those applications like uh, GSK and other people are using um, this to target the peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. so, so spiking neurons, it, the electrodes are a perfectly good way to go. Okay. For for anything other than that, for targeting other cell types, and in fact, uh, managing um, three-dimensional structures, so we're talking birth defects, cancer, which I'll talk about in a minute, regeneration, and so on, electrodes uh, are, are not a good way to, just, just because of the physics of it, they, they're not a good way to establish uh, standing resting potential gradients. Okay. Instead, uh, I think, and, and, and people, people sort of love this idea of getting away from the drugs, but I actually think that's, that's the wrong way to think about it. You see, what you have in the system itself is a bunch of ion channels that the system is using to drive its signaling, its information dynamics. Mm -hmm. And what you would really like to do, rather than trying to impose external fields externally, which is really hard to be specific about it, okay. you would really like to control the knobs that the system itself is using. You want to be able to open and close those channels. And, the, and nowadays, the best way to open in those, and close those channels is with drugs. Now, you might, in, a, in, a, in some systems, you might be able to use optogenetics, so you might be able to use light. In the future, there might be acoustic technologies, there might be, who, who knows, there might be other ways to do it. But I think there's no getting around the fact that the most specific and the most powerful interventions are going to be when you take advantage of what the system is doing normally. Okay. And, right? And, and, that, and that means that you need to, you need to have a, a model, a computational model of how those channels are contributing to specific information dynamics. And you need to uh, then be able to um, open and close those channels to set up standing resting potentials in tissue that's, that are what you want. Uh, th there's an analogy, you can, you can think about this um, as, as an analogy. Uh, a lot of modern uh, bi biomedicine is still focused on forcing the hardware. You are trying to literally, you know, people are very excited about okay. single molecule approaches, genomic editing. You're, you're working down at the level of the hardware. You're really trying to micromanage the process and get everything where it needs to be. Um, applied, field, applied electric fields are, are that type of thing. You're really trying to force the correct electric pattern with an external stimulation. Right. For certain things, there'll be some low-hanging fruit where that's great and that works great. But anybody who programs or has, has looked at the history of computer science from the beginnings in the 40s all the way through this amazing information technology revolution that we have understands that programming at the level of hardware is brutal. Programming mm -hmm. in machine code is only marginally better. And what you would really like to do is program at a particularly high level. Now, um, when I give a talk, I often show a picture of what programming looked like in the 40s. There's a there's a great photo of a, of a woman and she's sitting there and she's physically replugging wires. She's mm -hmm. re physically moving wires from here to there. Okay, that's, that's how you used to have to program. That is where biology is today. That we are all about rewiring pathways, transcriptional networks. Um, it's all about the hardware. The thing is that wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be amazing if in biology we could do what we do in computer science, which when you have a laptop and you want to switch from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring. Right. What you do is you manipulate the system with inputs. You give it experiences. In this mm -hmm. case, through a keyboard. In my case, through, um, through ion channel modulation or optical modulation. But what you're trying to do is you're not trying to micromanage the system. You're trying to provide stimuli or inputs 
inputs yeah. that you know will drive the system to the correct state. Now, this requires this, this whole strategy of, of, of um, motivating the system instead of, hard, instead of forcing it requires something very particular. It requires that the system itself be reprogrammable. It requires that what you're dealing with is a cognitive system. And some people, some people get, get really upset about this because it sounds like you're sort of bringing back some sort of weird animism or, or, or you know, anthropomorphism. But if, if we take ev evolution seriously and we realize that whatever our cognitive capacities are, they have to have a smooth evolutionary history all the way back. Sure. We have to ask ourselves, and, and, and of course, engineers, people who work in, in cybernetics, control theory, and so on, are super comfortable with non-magical devices that make decisions, that have memories, right? I mean, we, we have a science of this. We don't need to be afraid of it. So, so what, um, what I'm going to claim is that biology, and we can get into why I think uh, this, how this evolved, but I think most current biology is uh, is 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 a is a co is a primitive cognitive system. It exhibits what what we call basal cognition, meaning you no, know, of course it's not sitting there and thinking. You know, uh, uh, wouldn't it be nice if I had another finger? It's it's not a high order cognitive right. system, but it is one that has memory and can make decisions and can take measurements and can anticipate simple uh, patterns and stimuli. Sure. So so if we understood how this worked then what we would be doing is we wouldn't be trying to micromanage it and, and sort of, you know, put, put specific stem cells in specific areas and, and growth factors and all that. We would be trying to figure out what are the stimuli that drive the system to decide to make a limb or an eye or a heart of a particular size, and we would be operating at a much, at a, at a much higher level. Right. The benefit of this, of course, is that it's so much easier. I'll just mm -hmm. give a very simple example from, um, from neuroscience. If you have a rat and you want the rat to do a circus trick, put a little ball in the hoop, right? You have two, two, two ways to go about it. You can, if you know neuroscience to, the, to a degree that we, we don't, you could try to uh, manipulate every nerve in that rat's brain, play it like a puppet and get the body to move in a particular way to get it to do what it, what it needs to do. And maybe that's possible. Someday, maybe we'll be able to do that. But the, the great thing is that is that humans figured out oh well, probably 10,000 years ago that you can achieve the same result without knowing anything at all about what's between the rat's ears. You train the rat. Mm -hmm. You provide rewards and punishments. You incentivize the system. You offload all of that complexity onto the system itself. And that works because what you're dealing with is a complex uh, 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 co cognitive system that, um, that you can communicate with, not just force at the lowest level. Now, we have to be careful. This is all an empirical. So people sometimes say, oh my God, so a ball rolling down the hill, now you're going to say is a cognitive system. No, this is a very uh, empirical kind of thing. You sure. only, right, you only ascribe enough uh, cognitive metaphors to be the optimal way to control the system. So if you're dealing with a cuckoo clock or a ball rolling down the hill, you don't need this. You, you, in fact, you, you don't have it. You don't have access to any of this stuff. It's not that kind of a system. You have to, you have to interact with it via Newtonian mechanics at the lowest level. You have no choice. Right. But if you're dealing with a rat at the top of the hill, you'd be crazy to, to rely on, on something like Newtonian mechanics to figure out where this thing is gonna go. That you have a much better, you have a much better um, a set of uh, handles on the system if you acknowledge the fact that it has preferences it has inputs it has outputs it has things it can learn and things that it can't learn right so this is this is why i think fundamentally uh the, this question of electrodes versus versus drugs is just a microcosm of that whole of that whole issue and okay. i think we need to we need to learn it for, we need to learn these things from the informational concept now um, the cancer, the cancer question. So let's talk about what cancer really is. And, and, and I preface this by saying that um, cancer is, is not just one thing, right? Sure. There's, there's lots of, lots of phenomena we call cancer, sure. but let's just, um, let's pare it down a little bit. One way to think about cancer, and this is a way that was popular a long time ago, really fell out of favor in the genetics revolution and is now uh, slowly coming back, is the idea that, um, the real question isn't why do we get cancer? The real question is why is there ever anything but cancer? If you look at individual cells, right? Amoebas, I, I often show a video of a thing called lacrimaria. Um, you can, we, can, we can put a link to it maybe. Um, it's, an, it's an amazing little, little organism. You look at an individual cell and you see how competent these agents are. They are in their own scale. So at the scale of a single cell, they are handling their uh, physiology, their behavior, and their morphology in the case of, of cells that change their shape all the time, like this lacrimarian, they're handling it all um, in real time, no brain needed, incredibly competent. And so one 
might ask, how do you convince a bunch of these free agents to work together to, toward a common goal? The common goal being build a frog or a fish or a human, right? Build a body. And uh, this is a profound question, is how do, how do you get a collective to have a common goal that is so much larger than any of the members of the, of the collective? And whatever that mechanism turns out to be, you would necessarily expect that occasionally there will be breakdowns in, in, sure. in, inevitably. So at some point, what will happen is a single cell in this body. So, so these, these cells are connected. They they're, have kind of a, a large um, shared uh, a, a goal space that they're working on. And for whatever reason, imagine that one cell gets disconnected from this information um, flow. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's, there are a bunch of uh, cues that are telling all the cells what to do to work towards this, you know, this massive thing. And then all of a sudden, there's one cell that doesn't get the message, that can't get the message for whatever reason. As far as that cell is concerned, it is now reverted back to its ancient unicellular past. Right. It, it has shrunk its computational boundary. And in fact, um, in, in, a, in a different uh, publication, I call this the, the boundary of the self. You know, for the body, because all the, share, all the cells share physiological information, yep. the unit of, of, of work, the goal-directed unit is large. The self is huge. It's a body of some size or it's an organ or something like that. But an individual cell, all of that shrinks just to the sort of area around that cell. And as soon as that happens, the rest of the body is just environment. As far as that cell is concerned, it, 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 the self is small, it's that cell. Everything it does is for the benefit of that cell and everything else is just the outside world. So that boundary where, where you end and, and the world begins can shrink and grow during the lifetime of an individual. Normally it's, it's, it's fairly massive, but, but individual cells can, can, can get out and then they're, um, uh, they're inf once they're informationally cut off, they become single cell amoebas for, for all intents and purposes. Well, what do, what do single cell organisms do? They go wherever life is good. They proliferate as much as they can. So this is metastasis and, 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 and over proliferation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, recent data have even um, looked at the transcriptomes of these individual cells and noticed that literally at the level of gene expression, you can see them rolling back to an ancient uh, a, a really ancient uh, type of um, transcriptome that belongs to single cell, ancient single cell creatures. Right. So, so this is, this is my view of, of, of cancer in that it's an information disorder. It's a disorder yeah. of the computational boundary between self and world. And uh, what, we, what we did in, in my lab was to start to say, okay, if, if that's true, and if what you're looking at is is the importance of the connection between the cell and its uh, the, the uh, its neighbors, uh, we already know that bioelectric networks provide a massive amount of that information. Not alone, of course, chemical signals are critical. Biomechanics is critical. But we we work on bioelectricity. Mm -hmm. Then we said, okay, that view makes three predictions. It predicts that number one. Uh, if you do have an event where a cell becomes transformed and starts to make a tumor instead of a good organ, you should be able to see this very early on by an aberrant bioelectrical signature. You should be able to see that this cell is not connected to its neighbors. Okay? So you should be able to detect cancer this way. And we've shown, in fact, using voltage-sensitive fluorescent dyes, that as soon as uh, you introduce, an, for example, an oncogene, let's say a nasty human oncogene like KRAS mutations, into a, a perfectly normal cell, the first thing that it does is depolarize so that the gap junctions, meaning these electrical synapses that connect it to its neighbors, they close mm -hmm. and it becomes electrically isolated. And that, that bare fact has been known since uh, I think the 80s, but it hadn't been really plugged into this, to this um, kind of protocognitive view of, of life. Uh, so that's the first prediction. The second prediction is that you ought to be able to induce cancer and a cancer phenotype without anything being wrong with the genome. Right. And, and we've done this. So what we've shown yeah. is in the frog model, we've shown that you can cause basically um, full-on metastatic melanoma in tadpoles that have no genetic mutations, no oncogenes, okay. no exposure to carcinogens, nothing genomically wrong with them, nothing that you would ever know from uh, sequencing anything up until the tumor gets advanced enough that you're now seeing markers come up, you know, physiological yeah. markers come up. And so we can do this simply by temporarily uh, disrupting the electrical communication between two cell types, and and you get you get metastatic melanoma. The third and and probably most uh, most most exciting uh, uh, implication of this is that you ought to be able to go in reverse. So if there is a cell that has gone rogue in terms of disconnecting from its neighbors and shrinking its goals to unicellular goals of proliferation and migration, 
what you ought to be able to do is force it to reconnect. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be amazing if you, if you forced it to reconnect and then it, the, the other cells around it normalized it and, uh, and, 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 and rolled back this kind of cancer phenotype. And we've shown this. Now, as you say, uh, Beatrice Mintz and other people, Mary Hendricks, other people since then um, have shown that complex patterning environments, scenarios in which a lot of information is coming down from the body about what cells should be doing. This is not only embryogenesis, but regeneration. Mm -hmm. So tumor, tumors in the middle of a regenerating limb, for example, in salamanders. People have shown that that kind of environment can normalize cancer cells. Right. And, and people, have, people have been focusing on some biochemical signals, but it's completely unclear why, why this happens. We think, or, or at least I think, that it's partly because of this uh, electric connection. And so what we've done is we've taken taken uh, tadpoles into which we, ins we insert uh, human oncogenic mutations, so like, like KRAS. Normally, they make tumors, and you can see these tumors on the tadpoles. And then what we do is we go back in, and we use either light with optogenetics or drugs that target the ion channels, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we, we could misexpress channels directly. You go back in, and you force a, an electrical state that will uh, cause it to stay connected with, via gap junctions to its neighbors. And when you do this, you see a drastic reduction of tumorogenesis. Existing tumors uh, start to disappear. Now, they don't die. The key to this is that these cells, this is, this is not um, any kind of chemotherapy because the, the, the tumor cells do not die. What right. they do is they, uh, they normalize. Some of them move off. The thing basically sort of disbands. The tumor disbands. The cells join uh, other tissues in their vicinity, and they go on as a perfectly normal uh, perfectly normal animal. So I think, and, and we're now, so, so all of this stuff was done in frog, uh, with lot, lot, lots of um, papers in the frog model. Now we're starting to look at human uh, cells and tissues, and we hope that this is a, um, a, an approach to cancer that's different from chemo. So the idea is not to kill off as many of these cells as you can and hope you don't kill the healthy ones. The idea is to normalize or reprogram those cells back towards the large scale morphogenetic goals. You know, working off that same theme, um, you know, you spent a lot of time uh, studying regeneration in, in various models. Um, we, we, we have this term epimorphic where, you know, as you were saying before, we have a, a process of not just uh, cells uh, that are, remain after a, um, a, a, de a, a destruction event, um, erasing their history, but also this process of sort of intercalation where cells know, once again, specifically how to fill in uh, where they should be, where, you know, this whole, you know, uh, I'll, I'll refer to sort of what uh, this sort of this concept of these different regenerative laws that exist in nature, you know, you're, you're, you're really aware, well aware of them that uh, no matter how many times you chop off that salamander leg, you know, you're never going to get a foot up here. You're always going to have a proper progression of regeneration based on a lot of this. Um, I, I'd love to for, talk a little bit about some of your work in terms, you know, you, you've done stuff where you've created eyeballs on tails, and th things of this nature, which is pretty cool. At the same time, a couple of years ago, you had this fascinating paper. Uh, it was uh, titled Knowing One's Place, a Free Energy Approach to Pattern Regulation. It was uh, in the, the Royal Society uh, magazine, um, where you have a model in terms of, you know, for lack of a better, where do these patterns exist? Um, you know, where are they hiding out? You know, we can't find them in the genome. Can you talk a little bit about from sort of this physical perspective, you know, your concepts on, you know, where the, the limb pattern sort of exists in the context of the body remembering it. I think this sure. is really neat stuff. Sure, sure. Um, so, so let's start. Let's start by by uh, coming coming back to uh, our, our my my particular hypothesis, sure. which is which is that. Um, and this is this is very much. I mean, I should I should tell uh, tell the l listeners this is very much not a standard way to look at this. Okay, so this is not. I'm I'm not giving you the standard view that you will get from a developmental biology textbook. Sure. Uh, my my perspective on this is that regeneration and regulative development and those kind and tumor suppression, all of those things are examples of. Uh, error minimization. So there are examples of a system that in some simple way, not down to each individual cell position, but in some simple general coarse grained map of, of large scale body features, it stores a representation of what a correct salamander leg looks like. Yeah. This is um, uh, what we ought to, in, in a minute, we ought to also um, talk about um, some gaps in the modern paradigm that that I think drive us into this kind of conclusion. Sure. But let's just let's just talk about uh, what 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 that entails. 
if that's true, and, and the reason, that the, by the way, the reason this is very much a non-standard view is that um, in modern, uh, mo modern fields like this, it is very fashionable for, for many years now to uh, really try to avoid anything that sounds like teleology. So anything that sounds like the system has a goal or that it's trying to get to a particular place, what people really love nowadays is emergence. So this idea that um, there are complex systems that when you turn the crank and, and, and lots of subunits do simple rules again and again, complex things emerge. Emerge. And there's absolutely no doubt that emergence is important, um, that emergence is critical for lots of interesting phenomena. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I want to talk for a minute about this, this idea that there is a representation of the goal state. Sure. It, th that, that model makes a really peculiar prediction. What it predicts is that if you want to make changes to the large scale system, you okay. might not have to rewire the individual cells or components, you could change the goal state. Okay. Because because if the if what the if what the system is doing is trying to to get to whatever the, the 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 memory of the goal state is, you might just rewrite that, and let the cells build to whatever to the memory. Right? That's a mm -hmm. it's a completely different approach because if there is no if there is no memory if there is no pattern memory that the system is trying to get to if it's fully emergent, then you have no choice. There's there's really nothing to do except to 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 um, try to alter those low level rules that the cells are following. And uh, it's, the problem is, 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 is really, really hard. And you can think about it in the following way. Let's say, let's say you have a, a, a termite mound and it has a particular kind of chimney, right? And uh -huh. you say, okay, I want, you know what I want? I, I, I would like it, them to build a chimney that has, it, it's forked, it's got, it's got two. And so now the question is, okay, how do I change the rules that every single termite follows to give you a forked chimney instead of a straight one? Mm -hmm. Well, this is incredibly hard. It's called an inverse problem because what you care about is the large scale uh, uh, final outcome. But what you are trying to make changes in is the is a completely different level of events. It's the rules that every ant, uh, every termite has. Like, hey, if I meet another termite with a particular chemical, I will drop a piece of dirt or I'll pick up a piece of dirt. You know, these kinds of things. And going from one to the other is really hard. The same thing happens for, to us in uh, in biomedicine. What you really care about is how many fingers your patient has or how long their leg is or things like this. But the tools we have are things like you know, pro protein factors and, 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 and transcription factors mm -hmm. and knowing how to change those things to get to the correct large scale outcome is incredibly hard. Uh, this is, this is one reason I think that the techniques like genomic editing and so on, while really important are going to hit a limit if we, if we exclusively try to use bottom up approaches. So, uh, so, so, so my, my approach is, is, is that if we hypothesize that there is a pattern memory to which the system works, let's not try to address it from a, from a different lower level of the individual rules. Let's try to change the pattern memory. Okay. Mm -hmm. And remember on the, on the, on the traditional view, there is no such thing. So there's nothing to right. change. Yeah. So, okay. So, so what we've done is we've asked the question, if, if that's true, could we find the, could, could we see, detect and, and characterize this representation? And if we could find it, could we change it and get the cells to do something else? So I'm going to tell you the story of, of one particular example where we've done that. So um, think about uh, these things called planaria. So planaria are flatworms. Yep. They are uh, similar to our ancestor. They're not like earthworms. They're, they're true bilateral, they have true bilateral symmetry. They have a brain. Most of the neurotransmitters like you and I have um, complex organisms. Yep. The amazing thing about planaria is that they are champions of regeneration. So you can mm -hmm. cut them in any way that you like. Sure. Uh, the record, I think, is something like 273 pieces uh, back, in the, back in the day. And every single piece will grow exactly what's needed, no more, no less, mm -hmm. and make a tiny little worm. Now, the most amazing thing about regeneration, of course, is that it stops. It's easy enough to say that, well, we're just going to, uh, we're going to crank up cell division after injury. I mean, that's fine. But what happens is they stop when they, or, or let's say in a salamander limb, once it gets to be a correct salamander limb, whatever that means, then it stops. Right. So, so, so clearly operationally, the system knows what a correct uh, a limb looks like or a correct worm, and then it stops. Sure. So, so we ask the following question. Okay, um, we, have these, we have these planaria. Um, what is it that enables them to know? We ask the simple question, uh, head number. How many heads is a, is a worm supposed to have? The standard worm has one head, one head, one tail. And so we asked this question. Uh, and, and so what we started to do was to look at the bioelectrics 
of this process and to observe fragments uh, via these voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes that give us a kind of readout. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's all, it's, it's almost like a, uh, like a, like an EEG, but, but, but for the whole, for every cell. So you can see all the surface you could, you, you know, as long as you can see them optically, you see what all the cells are doing electrically. And what we found is that uh, the way that the planarian piece knows where to put the head and where to put the tail is that it has this really interesting bioelectrical pattern where the depolarization is telling you where the head is going to be, the hyperpolarization is telling you where the tail is going to be, and there's one of each. So then we were able to go in and, and artificially change this electrical pattern. And we were able to, let's say, take the posterior wound and say, you're going to be, you're, you're, we're going to depolarize you. So now the cells look and they say, well, I guess we make heads on both sides. And now you get a two-headed worm. Mm -hmm. So you literally get a two-headed planarian with heads on, on, on each end, right? And perfectly viable. Um, the cells are totally happy to build two normal, normal heads, if that's mm -hmm. what the bioelectric pattern says. And so, so that, was the, that was kind of the first amazing thing, is that it's clear that this pattern is instructive. It doesn't just read out where the head and tail used to be. It's actually instructive for what's going to happen in the future. Because if you rewrite it, you get a different anatomy. The most amazing thing about this is that when you take those two-headed worms and you recut them again in plain water, no more manipulations of any kind. So originally we used drugs to target the, the mm -hmm. electrical, you know, um, electrogenic proteins. No, mm -hmm. no more of that, just plain old water. So you take these worms and of course, uh, when, I, when I give talks about this, I usually ask people, I say, well, look, we have this two-headed worm. I'm going to cut off the ectopic head. I'm going to cut off the original head. I'm just going to keep the middle gut fragment. The genetics are untouched. We haven't re, we we haven't edited the genome, although the, the genomic sequence is exactly normal. What this this weird head tissue that people say, well, it's epigenetically reprogrammed. Okay, so it goes in the garbage. We we cut that off. Yeah. We take this this remaining gut fragment. I say, what do you think this thing's going to do? And of course, the standard paradigm is well, it has to go back to the default anatomy. The the cells have a standard genome. Uh, if you sequence them, there's nothing wrong with it. Therefore, they're going to make what what planarian cells make, which is a normal planarian. That's absolutely not what happens. So, yeah. you, so you take this two-headed worm, and it is forever, as far as we can tell, um, through many rounds of, of regeneration, it is now permanently two-headed. <laughs> so, so worth pausing for a moment to think about what that means. So, yeah. so the number of, and, the, and, the, and the spatial distribution of heads is determined by the memory of an electric circuit. The electric circuit, um, and there's some other stuff involved too, but, but, but these electric circuits store a pattern that tells the cells what on this large anatomical scale, what they're going to build. And not only uh, can it be changed, but it persists. So once you change it, it it keeps so it's a it's a true electrical memory actually we've learned to take it the other way so we can now take a two worm and, and a two-headed worm and change it back to being a one-headed mm -hmm. um so a, a worm's body can hold at least two probably more different memories of what a correct planarian looks like this is the this is the information to which the cells will build if they are damaged now so 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 why do i call it a memory well First of all, because it's stable, like a memory is supposed to be. It's cool. labile or rewritable, like okay. a memory is supposed to be. Uh, it is, um, there is also such a thing as um, uh, latent versus recalled memory. So we can take a worm, we can alter the electrical pattern, and as long as we don't cut it, it stays one-headed because that, that memory is latent. No, no one's calling it up. It's not being used for anything. As soon as we injure the worm, that's when it becomes active and the cells consult the, the pattern and they build a two-headed worm. But in the meantime, that body can store one of two, uh, one of two patterns, at least, probably more. So, so what we're able to do is we're able to directly look at a worm. We're able to see that pattern memory now. We're able to rewrite it and, and we can see that uh, the gene expression and the cell behaviors are controlled by this pattern. So this is just one example of the fact that, yeah, absolutely, we can see these target states. They're absolutely represented. Yep. Now, we've gone, we've gone further than this. And the other thing you can do, which is also kind of wild, is uh, the two other things should be, should be mentioned. One is that there's this electrical system, uh, aside from head number, you can think about head shape. And so one yeah. of the different planaria have different shaped heads. So there's triangular ones, flat ones, round ones, all different kinds of heads. Yeah. So what we can do is we can take a planarian with a triangular head shape, cut off the head, and basically prevent that uh, bioelectrical uh, network 
from uh, communicating very well. We can shut down these gap junctions, these electrical synapses for about 48 hours. Okay. So the network uh, enters this really chaotic state and then it settles back down. When you pull the drug out, it settles back down. The thing is that when it settles back down, some percentage of the time, it goes back to the same attractor that it used to live in, which is a normal planarian head. Okay. But it turns out there's some others and the others are, and, and sometimes the system stochastically will land in one of these other attractors. And, and believe it or not, these other attractors are uh, the, the represent the head shapes of other species of planarian. So what we can do is without touching the genome in any way, we can take that fragment and make it uh, regrow the head belonging to a different species of worm. It'll have a different shape. The brain will be a different shape. The distribution of stem cells will be different, exactly like these other species. These other species about, oh, probably between 100 and 150 million years of evolutionary distance. So what you have here is this really amazing divergence between the genomic information and the actual uh, physiological information that guides what the cells are actually doing. And uh, the, the, way, the way to understand this, there's, there's a couple of different um, ways that we use this, but the way to understand it is that what the genome does is it nails down the hardware. A lot of people think of the genome as the software of the cell. So, so I, 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 think, I think that's not the best metaphor. Right. I, think, I think a better way to think about this is that what the genome does is it tells every cell what proteins it gets to have. That's your hardware. Some of those proteins are electrical signaling, uh, uh, machinery, some are chemical, physical forces, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but once you put all those things together, there's a new layer that shows up, which is a computational layer that uh, is the software that runs on this hardware. And the mm -hmm. hardware is amazing. The reason the hardware is so, so cool is because, first of all, it's very stable. So most of the time, it does exactly the right thing. It always does the same, you know, planaria regenerate correctly just about 100% of the time. Right. But once you know how to give it correct inputs, which it took us, you know, what, 10, 10 12 years to learn to how to do this, once you know how to, how to put in the correct inputs, you can shift that software to a different mode, to a different activity mode, and you don't have to rewire it. You don't have to, um, in fact, if, if we wanted to rewire it, we wouldn't know how. If you wanted to do genomic editing to make to go from a round head or to a triangular head, how would you do it? We have absolutely no idea. Right. And so, uh, and so, but luckily you don't have to because the system is modular and 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 it represents these goal states that you can sort of choose among. You can also we have the th the third thing is that we've also made uh, some some really um, wacky things that don't look anything like planaria out of normal planarian cells. Mm -hmm. because uh, there are regions of that morphous space that our evolution doesn't use. I mean, they're not viable out in the, out in the wild, so right. evolution doesn't, doesn't see them. But, but you can, in fact, you can, make, you can make some really wild creations if, you, if, if you're operating at the level of uh, body plane information. Let's, let's take the planarian for a moment and then um, go in a direction. I, mean, I, I have tons of your... <laughs> I have tons of your... Um, your manuscripts around here, uh, and I, it's hard to pick my favorite, but clearly um, your paper, The Stability of Memories During Brain Remodeling, a Perspective in uh, Communicative and Integrated Biology is at one of the ones at the top. So um, here you, you know, you, earlier on, you talked a little bit about the, um, the ancient, uh, the ancientness of uh, these bioelectric networks, that neurons, you know, they came on the scene a couple hundred million years ago, whatever, but there was a lot happening before them. Uh, you highlight in this paper, obviously, that we're on a planet where we have many aneural organisms that don't have brains at all. Uh, we have these uh, bioelectric networks, not just you know in our nervous system, but we have them in heart and bone and pancreas and so forth. And then we have Obviously, and, and this is other. I'll, I'll get to this another question, but we have um, you know single cell organisms that you pointed out that like to get together with other organisms and create all sorts of interesting structures. Um, that being said, uh, going into the concept of remodeling of the brain, uh, obviously the work by uh, McConnell in, in the 1950s and Paul Peach at the University of Indiana in the 70s uh, showed that. Um, you know, you can destroy quite a bit of the stuff in there, of the planarians and the frogs, and you've also pointed out uh, uh, metamorphic insects and so forth in the paper. 
Uh, take us on a little path into the area of non-central nervous system information processing as far as uh, what we think of as humans are our memories. Uh, and I know this is a little more esoteric area, but it is clearly something that, you know, I think you are leading the, the, the march towards us really understanding what all of these other potential implications are for storing this cognitive stuff. Yeah, um, that's a, so. That's a very interesting question, and and because I think that uh, evolution is very continuous in the sense that uh, somatic information and behavioral information are all have all have fundamentally the same the same roots, and so even even unicellular organisms can learn, they can store uh, memories, some of them can anticipate. So we have to ask, uh, what does it mean to store learned information in living tissue? This is a really a basic fundamental thing. Like, what what is it? What is a memory? And these are the kinds of things that um, Warren McCulloch, uh, you know, b b and and the founders of connectionism really struggled with. Like, what what does it actually mean to store a memory, a proposition, a, a, a you know, a, 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 a logical proposition in in memory? So there is, of course, uh, this current paradigm, which is very much um, they call it a, a neural network or or a connectionist type of idea, which is that look, what you have is these you have a you have a you have a network of these of these uh, individual uh, units or cells, and they can uh, be triggered by inputs and they can pass on their outputs. And when through various means, when the whole thing gets trained on a bunch of stimuli, all those little the the, the likelihood of one thing triggering another thing gets adjusted to just the right level, so that as a whole, it's able to let's say sort uh, you know. Dot pictures of dogs from pictures of cats or some such thing you know this is mm -hmm. like modern deep deep nets and and so on so the 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 thing with this is and and of course of course it's had lots of success in specific um specific fields there are uh there's a problem with that as a general uh, explanation for how memory is stored, and and I'm not I'm certainly not um, the the only one uh, to have said this, and and the most like mm -hmm. some of the recent excellent work comes from uh, Glantzman, uh, the Glantzman lab, uh, mm -hmm. on on transfer of of chemical memory. It, it's yep. been known for a long time that, as you say, that memory is remarkably. Uh, robust to changes of the underlying medium. So, for example, a caterpillar will learn something uh, on the pro during the process of metamorphosis of becoming a, a, a butterfly. The brain gets mostly dissolved, uh, remodeled. A lot of the uh, the neurons either either die or or, or the synaptic connections mm -hmm. are broken. A completely different brain is rebuilt, and the butterfly remembers the original information. Yep. So, what is this telling us about? Uh, of, of, of course, of course, uh, the artificial neural networks don't don't have this property, right? And we don't. In fact, we don't have this. Is something we're actually um, actively trying to develop in our lab. Is the uh, is a is a set of um, policies for a kind of uh, ANN like uh, uh, scheme that would be robust to these incredible deformations. You know, when you regenerate a portion of your brain, what happens? All of this is has has clinical implications because pretty soon we'll be injecting uh, naive stem cells into the brain of sixty year old patients that have you know six decades of of memories and then what happens to, right, to, right. to personal identity what happens to right um, so but but it also has really fundamental implications of what does it actually mean for a bunch of uh, uh, neurons to store something you've learned mm -hmm. we really don't know I mean people study LTP and and things like this but it's completely unclear what it is. So um, Warren McCulloch was looking for an invariant. He was looking for some physical thing that is the same whenever you think about a particular concept that's the same, right? Yeah. And if you think about your memory of, you know, you probably have a memory from, from your early childhood, let's say before you were 10, and, and now however many decades later here we are, the question is, what physical structure has actually stayed the same in your brain that could possibly, right? What, what's a candidate for, for something right. that's that long lived that doesn't change? Really hard to visualize how that would work. So, so between that and these kinds of uh, experiments on brain regeneration, mm -hmm. uh, moving of memories via chemical extracts, the old stuff from, from um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Ungar and, uh, and McConnell and now the latest work by Glantzman and others, there's something fundamental that we're missing about what memory is right. and one possibility and I'm just I don't have any proof of this I'm throwing this out as a, as a possibility one possibility is that what the nervous system is for is not storing the memories what the nervous system is for is for interpreting 
the information in the cells, which might be cytoskeletal, it might be biochemical. I mean, Glantzman thinks it's RNA. Maybe the other, a lot of people like RNA as a medium, whatever it is, you need to be able to interpret it. Right. And one possibility is that what the networks are for, are, the neural networks are for, are for interpreting that information and turning it into signals to behavior, muscles, glands, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, so that's 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 something that's the kind of thing we we think about. It is it is entirely unknown. Uh, it's the, saying that memory is in the brain is like is like saying that the anatomy of the body is somehow in the DNA. I mean, it's a it's an it's a simple thing to say, and people say it all sure. the time. It's very hard to cash that out in a way that actually makes sense, you know, specifically. It had, there are lots of difficulties with, with understanding how this works. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's a profound question of, of what, what, what actually it means to store memory. Yeah, totally agree. But it, uh, I, I, I like the fact that you're out there uh, asking these questions. So, I mean, it's uh, extremely important that someone has to. And it, 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 uh, it obviously falls within your, <laughs> within your specialty. So I think it's great. Um, you know, coming back to um, your sort of the funding and uh, of of your programs and so forth, you know, you um, you had a rather large grant from uh, Paul Allen's um, Frontiers Group a couple of years ago, the, the, the late co-founder of Microsoft, uh, which whose mission in this group was to sort of look at this, these frontiers of science and, and identifying pioneer explorers like yourself. Can you just talk a little bit, because, you know, obviously I come out of the traditional pharmaceutical industry and, you know, I've, I've had my feet in sort of the venture capital space and know how sort of traditional investors think. And, you know, they like, you know, it's a, a lot of times sort of a lemming effect. What has it been like? What's your experience? What's it been like in sort of championing some of these new ideas? Um, I mean, that, that, do you find it easier nowadays that you have some of this, these other big guns behind you? Um, because you are sort of, really on the, on the bleeding edge of stuff. What's it, talk a little bit about just sort of what you've experienced out there in terms of uh, sort of 2020 funding for some of this really cutting edge work. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I'll preface everything by saying that um, I, I'm not complaining in the sense that, we, you know, it's been 20 odd years and we've been uh, generously supported by NIH, NSF, DARPA, mm -hmm. you know, so, so, so I'm, I'm not complaining by any means. Uh, the reality is that a lot of funders are very risk averse sure. and um, things that look like obvious great things that uh, once they're done and published are inevitably the things that people originally said, okay, but that's never going to work. The previous X <laughs> number of things work, but that, that right there, that's never going to work. And then afterwards people are like, ah, well, that, that's cool. But you're, the next thing now, that's definitely not going to work. So, <laughs> so, so people, people are tend to be quite risk averse. And I think it's, it's, people as successful people are very well calibrated on their own field and they have their own frontier ideas that they're willing to take bets on but things that are in a diff slightly different field that that um you know is not their favorite cup of tea they're much less willing to to give a benefit of the doubt for for novel just new ways of thinking about it so um that's just been my my experience so uh i think what we have tried to do is to really um target uh, correctly what the needs of a particular funder are so 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 for example if we're going for a relationship with biotech we have to be very clear about there's going to be a particular biomedical application at the end of this you know they don't really want to hear about philosophical questions about what memory is and things like this they they want a clear path to here's how we're going to we're going to cure xyz right so so we have we have um, work in limb regeneration for example inducing limb regeneration and um, these are, uh, you know, the, this is, this, there's, there's some, uh, there, there's some, there's some biotech funding around that. Um, there are other, uh, funders that are interested in much more basic kinds of things. So there was a, you know, there was a, the, the Mathers Foundation was very good to us for some very basic initial work on mm -hmm. uh, cracking the bioelectric code. Of course, um, the Allen uh, Frontiers Group, which really uh, got, got, got our center uh, started, um, yep looking at this, uh, at this, at this morphogenetic code, what they call the dark matter of biology. That was Paul's, uh, Paul's phrase. Um, so we're, we're, we're very grateful, uh, very grateful for, for those kinds of things that support frontier efforts in areas where you're not sure what exactly yet, you're not sure what exactly the outcome is going to look like. 
you know? And uh, that's very important because when, for, for traditional funders, you need to be very clearly specifying, you need to very clearly specify what the success and failure criteria are and what are you gonna produce? What are the deliverables? And in order to do that, you kind of have to already have mapped your area out pretty mm -hmm. well if you know what you're gonna get out the other end. And some projects are very much like that where you can do that and other projects you really can't. So we, we try for a mix of funders with different preferences. There are some that really want the frontier stuff. They wanna be at the cutting edge of, of, of new things and others that really wanna be pretty practical about, okay, what are you gonna get at the end of three or four years? And, and it's a patchwork of, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work actually. It's a lot of um, hard work. Uh, producing a best uh, case for whatever we want to do for these for these various things, and uh, and it's a real mix of of private um, and, um, and 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 public funders to try to try to keep all this stuff afloat because they all have they all have different preferences of areas that they want to advance. Great, great. Just a, a two more two more questions. Um, one, um, as people to watch this show, I usually give the. Uh, the bio of my guests to my kids to to come up with some interesting questions. Um, and this one is from my uh, my twelve year old daughter. Uh, she actually, uh, you know, a couple several months ago, Josh Bongard came on the show to talk about uh, your your work with Xenobots. Um, and actually, right before that, we had uh, Penny Boston from NASA who was running things in astrobiology. And uh, my daughter just wanted a <laughs> and nothing confidential, of course, but uh, she was rather, you know impressed by all the potential stuff that had to do with space and that these xenobots may be uh, good alternatives to either sending humans or robots uh, to colonize planets. Any, any interesting cosmobiological stuff that, uh, that you can talk about that you're doing or anything new on the xenobots front for that matter. She was rather interested. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sure. Let's see. Um, well, so so for now, the xenobots uh, only um, operate in a in a water environment of uh, pro you know pretty reasonable room temperature. So I think I think uh, it it remains to be seen exactly what the role of uh, something like a xenobot would be in a in in unknown environments where things are things are very different. Um, I, I, I think about it in, in a slightly different way, however, I, I, think, I see the Xenobots as a new model system for life as it could be. Okay. And the idea is, you know, when we go out there, we are going to, uh, I, I hopefully, uh, encounter some really interesting uh, different kinds of environments. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to answer an interesting question. Is there life there? Right. And right now, we're operating with an N of one example of what life looks like. It's the life here on earth. Sure. And, and even there, there are some corner cases where like, mm, it's kind of unclear what's going on there. Uh, there are some, uh, we, in fact, we're writing, a, I'm writing a, a review right now of some of these weird cases where it's completely unclear what the individual is, what's the organism is it, you know, because there are all kinds of weird configurations of different types of cells living together and so on. Yeah. So, so I think that one thing we need to really do is nail down what we mean by the words organism, alive, evolution, body, uh, death, all of these things, uh, we, we throw these words around, they're not obvious at all. And um, we're gonna, we, we should nail them down for our work here on earth, but even more importantly, it's gonna be, it's gonna be critical so that we, we have some idea of knowing what we're looking at when we see uh, lots of complex things happening and we have to say, so is that, biofilm is that a single organism is that a, you know you can imagine these scenarios where you don't even know the right scale is that just chemistry or is that actually alive is that is right. this thing learning is it what what what, what where's the which part of this is the organism so um it's much less obvious than it seems and and the xenobots are a good example of that so um i'm i'm in the process now of of writing a, a, a paper on on the sort of uh philosophical implications of these xenobots and you, one of the things about the the the, the ones that we've made is you, you take cells from an organism and you liberate them from the, the, the you know, the, 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 the frog as it were, and they re-envision their multicellularity and they assemble something completely different mm -hmm. this time around. They do, they, they have a different shape and structure. And if you um, chop them into pieces, the pieces do something else that's completely different. And so one thing you could imagine is, uh, is and, and, and I start off this paper like, like this, um, imagine, imagine the following scenario. So you're exploring a planet and you see this animal and the animal's running around doing things and then it dies, the animal dies. But 
we all know that when a body dies, most of the cells are usually alive. Right. It's right. And so, and in fact, there have been studies of people, you know, recovering and culturing cells from cadavers that are quite sure. old and things like this. Right. So in a, in an appropriate environment, so let's say this is an aquatic animal, like a frog or a fish, it's entirely feasible that the individual cells, or at least some individual cells after the organism dies, disband and continue their life as unicellular forms. Tumor mm -hmm. cells can do this. We already know sure. they can do this. And so you might imagine this, this on another planet, you might imagine this interesting life cycle where there's a multicellular body, but after death, the body's gone, but most of the cells go on and mm. the genome continues itself as a kind of unicellular, you know, as, as, as a set of amoebas, basically. And we know that being an amoeba is a viable lifestyle. Plenty of right, amoebas right, do right. it. So there's really no reason why that couldn't be. And then some of them may or may not get together again as, um, as for example, dictostelium amoebas do, sure. and form a new body, reverse. So it's sort of a reversal back and forth of a developmental process. Um, and they, could, they may or may not recombine with others. It may be cyclical, it may not. But you could imagine these really weird cases in the biosphere that becomes, so now, you know, uh, you, you have an organism where the genome of the amoeba is exactly the same as the genome of the organism. And so that might be your first clue that something like this is happening. Uh, whether that happens on Earth, I have no idea. We can certainly do it artificially, as, as we all know, uh, in the lab. But whether that happens in nature, we don't know. Hmm. Um, I mean, some cancer cells, you know, like uh, Tasmanian devil uh, cancer spreads, it hops from animal to animal. So right. those, cell, those animals, those cells can actually move, move on when the, if despite whatever else happens to the host, they can move on. Uh, so so I, I only bring up that example to say that the xenobots, aside from like very practical applications, you know, maybe they're cleaning up waterways, maybe they're exploring, right. searching for something, maybe they're working inside the body to clean out cancer cells, there's a million applications. But aside from all of that, uh, I think what they're telling us is that life is incredibly plastic, yeah. even life that occurred here. And I'm sure, I'm sure Josh um, Bongard mentioned this, but our xenobots are, as far as I'm aware, the only creature whose evolution didn't take place in the biosphere. Their evolution took place right. in a virtual world of Bongard's computers. Yep. The cells evolved here. But those cells evolved to sit quietly on the outer, outside of a frog and keep out the pathogens. They mm -hmm. certainly, the, the, the bodies of these xenobots that run around and do various things, that has never existed in their history right. before. They, they were not that. And so that just tells you this. So, so I think, I think what's, what's important about this and, 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 and space exploration is that it opens your eyes to the, the, the no doubt immense variety that we could see out there of, of ways of being alive. And uh, I think you know, our, our imagination for sure is, is too tightly constrained by this one example that we've seen, which is sure. the, the Earth. Sure. Yeah. It'd be amazing if that, uh, that shape-shifting <laughs> organism potentially keeps the memory of every multicellular one that died before it. Yeah. <laughs> right? really think about this stuff. I mean, that's, that's yeah. kind of what planaria do, right? So planaria reproduce right. by right. fissioning and uh, planaria definitely learn from experience. Now, how long do they remember? We don't know. Is there much for them to learn sitting in a, in a Tupperware container of water? I'm not sure, right. you know, if there's anything exciting for them to remember, but uh, it's not impossible. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a possibility. Really fascinating. Uh, Mike, this is the last question we, 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 uh, we have our guests uh, respond to, just really about um, the influencers and, and mentors sort of that have been with you along this path that uh, have you know kept you interested in this um, domain as you've gone along and if it, you know if it wasn't for them that you know you'd be off doing something totally different any specific people no doubt you've known a lot throughout your career but anyone you want to highlight here shout out to uh, at this point in the show yeah, there there have been there have been a lot of uh, mentors and, and people that I look up to. Um, I think uh, the most obvious one is Susan Ernst, who um, she's now retired, but she was a developmental biologist at Tufts when I was a student. And making my decision to uh, get into biology in addition to the computer science that I was doing, mm -hmm. I knew zero biology. I uh, I approached her to do research in the lab, and um, we worked together for uh, for for several years. And uh, and and she she was really instrumental in my uh, entry into into biology 
Um, and then, of course, during grad school, um, my, my PhD mentor, Cliff Tabin, with whom I still work, he's in fact a member of our Allen Discovery Center, uh, he really was, that, that, that time period and his, his mentorship was instrumental for, for me to see what modern biology was like, what the mm -hmm. tools are, what, you know, what, what are the, what are the state of the art approaches to genetic um, understanding of, of life. And, and he both, both in the subject matter, but also um, how to do uh, high, um, uh, high impact science with, with real integrity. You know, he was mm -hmm. kind of a, uh, a, an amazing example of that. Uh, my, my postdoc mentor, um, Mark Mercola, who uh, by then, uh, I, I was sort of talking to people about some of my crazy ideas, whereas before I kind of kept it, uh, kept things under wraps. But, but by, by the time I was in Mark's lab, I started talking about these things and, and, and he was pretty helpful in, uh, in guiding me uh, to, um, to, to, to funding and to get my first independent position and so on. Um, lo lots of other people I, I work with, you know, D D Don Ingber was always a, a huge inspiration sure. to me because of his work and just uh, his approach to science. Um, uh, people, people like that. So, uh, yeah, lots, I mean, too, too many to, to mention, but those sure. are some big names. Sure. Sure. Well, it, it's, it's really been, um, an honor having you join us today. I mean, every, I've, as I said, I've, I've followed you for years. I've, I've always been amazed by your, your thought leadership in, in this really, this frontier area, uh, that, that has so wide, uh, a set of potential from embryology to regenerative medicine to, to oncology and to, to understanding the basics of you know what goes on in here it's uh it's really great stuff and i really wishing you the best on it and um for everybody that's uh that's going to be listening on the various podcast networks or watching on the youtube channel you've had the the honor of being joined by dr michael levin tufts university professor uh vannevar bush endowed chair in the biology department director of the tufts center for gender and developmental biology and director of the allen discovery center at tufts uh mike thank you for for taking the time to come on the show thank you for everything that you've been doing and continue to do and as we say thank you for moving the human story forward but in this case thank you for moving the xenobot story forward as well uh and we're really gonna be watching as, as everything moves forward because it's, it's it's truly amazing thank you so much i really appreciate the chance to talk to you about this it's been a lot of fun um and thank you for your support